I've had the pleasure of knowing Michelle for quite some time. I won't say how long. Um, but uh, from our days actually back here when I was working just down the road at Sarnoff, and she was a postdoc with Shirley Tillman at Princeton, as I recall. Um, Michelle now has joined the Mark Foundation as CEO in January of this year. Prior to that, she was Vice President of Clinical Translation Technologies and Operations at BMS. She led research teams there using cutting edge technologies to accelerate drug discovery and development for cancer and other diseases before joining BMS. Michelle was at Merck, overseeing the development and application of innovation platforms, understanding molecular mechanisms of cancer, identification of new therapeutic approaches for multiple diseases, and functional validation. Her team conducted pioneering work on microRNAs, um, and that was actually a very exciting time, and I had a chance actually to work a little bit with Michelle on that. Michelle is co-author of more than 50 research, primary research papers. She received a PhD in molecular microbiology and genetics from Stony Brook, completed a graduate research at Cold Spring Harbor, did her training, postdoctoral training at Princeton, and she's been, in addition to her position at the Mark Foundation, she's a member of the board of directors of the Society for Laboratory Automation and Screening, which is a scientific society dedicated to advancing life sciences. So with that, uh, let me turn the uh, podium over to Michelle. Thank you. Hey, Tom. Are you able to hear me okay? I think should, I should be on. So actually, Tom and I do know each other for a very long time. And one way that you can mark time very effectively is by the ages of your children. So I was around for the birth of Charlotte, who is Tom's first, who's now in graduate school. And Tom was around for the birth of both of my children, one of whom just started college this year. So well over 20 years. Um, and I want to thank Tom, the organizers, and Ronnie for inviting me to speak today. This will probably be the first time that I actually give a talk where I don't have data from my laboratory to show. So it's a bit of an experiment for, for me. But I do want to tell you about what's been a very exciting journey for me this past year in a new endeavor in the nonprofit world. So I'm with the Mark Foundation for Cancer Research. And the Mark Foundation was actually set up by an investment banker named Alex Canaster. Alex's father succumbed to cancer in 2014. He had kidney cancer. Um, and Alex, being a technology-minded person, his original training was in engineering, was a little bit frustrated by what he saw as a hit or miss nature of the treatments that were offered to his father. Um, this is, we're going to try this now, see if it works. If that doesn't work, we'll try something else. They had exceptional doctors, but it just told him something about where the field of cancer research and cancer treatment was in this 21st century. So he wanted to be part of the solution. And so we set up the foundation, um, and I came on board to lead it at the beginning of 2017. We're now an organization of six people. We're building not only a nonprofit uh, operational organization to give out grants, but we're also building a scientific organization. So we're recruiting scientists to come on board to help us with our grantees and to allow us to be part of the network of cancer research and to make intellectual as well as financial contributions. And we're really trying to differentiate our model. Uh, there are a lot of cancer research foundations. There are a lot of foundations who donate money to cancer research. An intern who's working in our group recently put together a list for me, and there are well over 2,000 organizations whose portfolio have cancer research projects among them. So lots of money going in this direction. But we feel that we can take a slightly different approach. We want to do what other cancer research foundations want to do in funding highly risky but high reward projects. Um, we want to do that in a way where we're actually being critical and thoughtful about it. We thought that the first step to actually being successful in this space would be to assemble the right network of scientists, take a step back, and with thought leaders, identify where the gaps and challenges lie in the field. Once we get an understanding of what those gaps and challenges are, come up with potential solutions. And one of the things that will be of a special interest to us 
is solutions that bring technology to bear, that bring innovation into the mix. Our founder is someone who has been involved in innovation on the technology side in other industries, and he's seen the benefit of taking that approach, would like to apply it here. Uh, we also want to create a network of collaborators, so not only our grantees, but others in the field of cancer research, as well as others in the field of philanthropy, so that in this community type of approach, we can truly move the field forward. And then we want to make sure that scientists who are doing the best science can pay attention to doing the science and not worry about constantly having to go out and seek grants. So if there's a mechanism for us to play a role in allowing those scientists to stay in science, dedicate their efforts to doing the work, but more importantly, raising the next generation of great scientists, then we'll feel that we've made some, some impact. And then we're going to build into our model something a little bit different. Other foundations in other fields of life sciences are trying this now. But in addition to giving out, giving out grants, we're also going to do some venture philanthropy. So we will make investments. Of course, the return on investment for us primarily will be better outcomes for cancer patients. But we also would seek to get some financial return that would come back into the foundation for future investments. And so philanthropy actually, as I mentioned, 2,000 different foundations and philanthropies that are dedicating themselves to cancer research um, plays a really big role. And there have been some pretty notable contributions from philanthropists to the field of cancer in the last couple of years. I saw this quote from Eli Brode, who's a very well-known philanthropist who has put a lot of money towards life sciences. Everyone has heard of the Brode Institute. And I thought that this was especially relevant to what we're trying to do. Um, Eli actually highlights that he'd like to see philanthropists putting their money where government won't or can't. And also remarks, I think, uh, very, uh, in, in a very observational way that when philanthropists back something initially downstream, when momentum is actually gathering, then government comes on board and will follow through. And we've actually seen this happen recently. Um, I know there was a lot of interest and hype about um, the foundation medicine assay that was FDA approved last week. But two weeks prior to that, there was another assay, very similar sequencing genomics-based assay, the MSK impact assay that was also FDA approved. And that assay started with foundation money. I think the Farmer Family Foundation initiated some of the work, the seminal work for the MSK impact assay. And so um, lots of money, lots of interest. Why cancer? Well, cancer is still a leading cause of death worldwide. And in the United States, hundreds of thousands of people die every year from cancer. Um, liver cancer, cancer is still ranking up there as one of the number one killers uh, in the United States and worldwide. And we like to point out we're a New York City-based organization. So when we go out there and we talk to our partners, we like to point out that across the globe, 8.2 million people on average are dying from cancer every year. This is the entire population of all five boroughs of New York City. So in essence, this disease is wiping out an entire huge metropolitan region every single year. So that's, that's, that's pretty impactful. And even though in 1970s there was a war on cancer uh, declared, we feel that um, we're still not really winning that war. If you look at, we'll take both sexes in this case because there has been advances made for males, certainly, and this is more along the lines of early detection and prostate cancer. But if you look at what's happening uh, from the 1970s until now, till close to now for both sexes, we're making marginal uh, impacts in terms of solving the cancer death problem. But the lines are pretty flat, and um, it's still a serious problem. So um, is there a way to make it better? And certainly in the last few years, there's been a lot of attention paid to precision medicine, and possibly precision medicine in cancer being the solution to this, this uh, outstanding problem. If 
we look at how precision medicine is defined. And we, we hear terms like precision medicine, personalized medicine, and certainly there are nuances to, to both terms. Precision medicine typically refers to the genomics, taking a, a look at genomics or genetics of a tumor, figuring out what the driver mutations are, figuring out what mutations the tumor might be addicted to, and then putting in place therapies that are uh, particularly targeted to those proteins that are going either losing or gaining function. And so uh, it looks like it could be a simple fix. Find the mutations, here's the drug, the drug matches the mutation, let's treat the patient and all is good. But in actuality, it's a lot more complex than that. And certainly people in the drug discovery world understand this. Um, not only do we need to know what the right, potential right target is, we need to also understand who's the right patient. So how are we going to figure out which patients are going to benefit? And that's what the topic of the next two days will focus on. Um, but we also need to figure out how to give the right dosing to those patients. Once we have a therapeutic, we've identified those patients, we want to get them, them the right dose. And then finally, we also want to understand how to know that our drugs are working. And this is another place where diagnostics are particularly important. Biomarkers can tell us in a surrogate fashion without waiting in the case of cancer until patients are actually dying that drugs are actually working. And so a lot of development needs to be done in that regard. So um, taking one more step back and thinking truly about precision medicine, uh, it goes beyond just genomics. There's a lot of molecular information that can be gathered by looking at patients at many different levels, including pathology, genomics, and many other multi-omic approaches, proteomics, looking at cells, looking at aminophenotypes. And so it becomes a really complex data problem that needs to have a, a te technology infusion in order to get it to really come to bear in a meaningful way. Uh, so there's multiple steps involved. We can certainly get a sense of the molecular profiles, get a sense of prognostic markers and other markers of resistance, sensitivity, and adverse events. But if you think about going from end to end, in some cases, while this can be done today, it typically takes from six weeks to six months for an answer on any given patient or their tumor in order to give the physician an idea of how that, that patient might benefit from existing treatments. And so there's still a lot of information that's lacking. We don't have really robust ways to, in a patient-specific way, validate that the hypotheses that come out of this process are truly going to work for that patient. We still need to deal with side effects and toxicities. Um, and then while some of these will be straightforward, here's the mutation, this is what's happening to the protein, here's the drug, um, in many cases, we're going to have to rely on combination strategies, and the way that combinations are being pursued today is in a little bit of a hit or miss fashion, although there's quite a bit of rationale that goes into the thought process. Uh, we, we do really need to have more robust ways of choosing combinations that'll work for cancer patients. And then one of the areas that has quite a bit of attention and is really important is once we have these treatments in place, there's going to be resistance. We need to understand how that's actually going to occur and be ready for it with drugs that come right away down the pipeline um, once that patient's cancer has recurred. And so what we really want to see is we want to have more of an ideal future for cancer precision medicine where not only do we have uh, more of these gaps in the process filled, particularly when it comes to patient-specific experimental validation, but we've also been able to shrink the timeline of molecular profiling data in to option for a patient out and patient treated within less than two weeks. Many of these patients actually don't have that amount of time before their cancer is really going to overcome them. And what we also want to see in the field is better choices for effective therapies and combinations, more rationale approaches, getting rid of those side effects, uh, and then mechanisms to monitor patients 
uh, over the long term so that once cancer reoccurs, we can rapidly detect it. And not only can we detect it, but we know what its molecular nature is, so we can come in very quickly with a backup treatment. And um, these are all things that still need quite a bit of research behind them. So who's going to fund the personalized therapies and combinations? Well, this is an area where there is a straightforward path to some kind of a return. And this is an area that is typically funded by biotech and pharma. Quite a bit of money goes into all of that. And we've seen quite a number of successes in the past few years, particularly in the immunotherapies. So this is not necessarily a place that uh, foundations or philanthropies would put their, their focus. However, when you think about the biomarker development and the data analyses, and I've only put illustrations of a few platforms that could possibly play into informing better me medical decisions downstream. This is a huge data problem. Um, we see a lot of groups who come forward with potential solutions in machine learning. A new term that I've heard this week is active learning. Uh, we don't just let the machine take what we give it and then learn from it. We allow the machine to continually learn on its own. And these, putting these platforms in place will be uh, prohibitively expensive, very complex, will take a lot of time unless there's a huge, strong, coordinated effort to make this happen. And while some of this will be funded by government and biotech, there are going to be significant gaps, particularly in areas where there isn't a straightforward path to understanding what the return is going to be. And then the patient validation, which I think is really key to success in this regard, is a high-risk endeavor. A lot more work needs to be done on that, in, on that front. Certainly sequencing um, itself is shaping up in a very robust way as being informative for precision medicine. Uh, there are new approaches in the organoid or uh, 3D culture space that are starting to arise and show a lot of promise. But these need to be further developed. They need to be standardized. And they need to be shared broadly um, to allow the field to actually utilize them in a maximal way. Uh, Patient-derived xenografts can show some value from the research perspective, but actually using patient-derived xenograph and the models that are built around them is very time-consuming. It's very risky. I think I heard 15% uh, of the time it works and the rest of the time it doesn't. And then mouse models we know have a long way to go to actually represent the human physiology that we need to represent to get the best choices for doctors. And so our foundation feels like we can do something to help in this regard. Uh, we want to fill knowledge gaps in biology. We want to help enable those technologies that are emerging to actually uh, fulfill their promise. Uh, we also want to put our money where m other money isn't going. So we tend to look for projects that are great ideas, but government's not ready to fund it. VCs don't want to hear about it, and pharma wants to see a lot more data. So we're actually seeing a lot of those projects come forward and uh, supporting them. We want to be inspired by the scientists and their science, and that's one reason why we're putting together a scientific organization as well as a grant-making organization. And then finally, our ultimate goal is to achieve those better outcomes for patients and their families. And so we've already started, even though we're not quite one year in existence. We have a pretty robust grant portfolio. We haven't done much on the venture side. Hopefully next time I can tell you more about that. But we've done some co-sponsorship of postdoctoral fellows. We didn't feel like we should rebuild the inter infrastructure for that since there are some really great organizations that do this and we've partnered with those organizations. Um, we will do some early career investigator awards. We've partnered there again, but this is something that we will do ourselves in 2018, and we're gearing up for that request for a proposal. We've funded um, some pretty significant collaborations. We've given money to Johns Hopkins University. They are doing a collaboration with Fred Hutch and Memorial Sloan Kettering. 
on uh, coming up with standardized approach to predicting neoantigens and then validating those neoantigens for vaccine strategies. And this is a really great project coming forward. And then we're looking at what we call um, the potential to fund medical research organizations, where within an institution, we allow for multiple disciplines to come together to solve a big, big problem. So different investigators generating different data streams, and then the mathematicians and the informaticians that are needed to integrate those data streams effectively. We're also doing something slightly different from other foundations where we're entertaining one-year feasibility studies where it's just an idea, similar to the SBIR phase one grants where we would entertain, entertain funding the proof of concept or the feasibility of a great idea. After a year's time, we'll have a conversation about potentially funding more. And this is something that we're doing with Rich Klinghoffer's company, Presage. You'll hear a little bit about that this afternoon. Um, and we're looking to do our own request for a proposal later this, later this year. And so just very quickly, I want to acknowledge my colleagues at the Mark Foundation, uh, Rebecca Bish, Cassandra Davis, Krista Justice, and Pat Lewis. Most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge our founder, who's been extremely generous, completely open to any ideas that we bring forward as a potential way to take the foundation. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, so I'll close there and happy to take any questions.